and we're just this cloud of gas and dust. And somewhere nearby, there's a supernova explosion. Remember, the Big Bang was 13.8 billion years ago, so there's already other solar systems, other parts of the universe out there. We haven't formed yet, we're just this cloud of dust. But this nearby giant star blows up, becomes a supernova, and it does a couple things. It gets our nebula spinning, it gets it rotating, so it becomes a disk, and now centripetal force, and that starts bringing the heavy material, the dense material toward the center, the light stuff stays out at the edges. And this supernova, when it blows up, creates all that upper end of the periodic table, doesn't it? So all of that kind of gets spewed out, and our nebula is the recipient of this seeding of the upper complexity of the periodic table. So we kind of get a head start in a way of making these um, more complex elements. We get this gift from this nearby exploding supernova. So the disk starts to spin. It means our proto-sun is going to start to form, which becomes our sun today. And things are going to start to accumulate in the disk. Once you have matter, you get gravity, because you have to have mass to get gravity. And the bigger the piece of material, the more gravitational attraction it exerts. The further away something is, the less gravitational attraction. So there's this kind of balance between size and distance that's always going on. But with gravitational attraction, that means a, a bigger piece of material will pull in a smaller piece of material. They'll collide and they'll accrete. They'll join together and become an even bigger piece of material. And that means it's got more ability to pull in more and bigger pieces. So once this process kind of gets going, it really takes off and it just kind of feeds on itself. And this is the accretionary phase of the disk. The sun's coming together and out in the cloud, the rotating cloud, the bigger chunks are kind of sweeping up the smaller chunks and we're making just a few big bodies out in this rotating disk. These are going to become the planets. And the disk is kind of going away. We can see this today. We showed this picture before, but this is a close-up now. And here's the um, cloud of the nebula in Orion's belt. And we can see the stars. And when we look at the stars close up, we can see the protoplanet in the center, and we can see the accreting disk around it. We can see solar systems being built today. Is that not cool? Is that not just one of the neatest pieces of evidence you could ever hope for? I mean, the Hubble Space Telescope, when it took this picture, paid for itself right there. So we see all these little plumps out there, and little by little, bigger clumps are pulling them in. They just keep getting bigger and bigger and bigger, and they become planets. Now, it would make sense that if this process were going on, that you know all the clumps are kind of the same, and they're all getting pulled in. So it would say that the resulting planet ought to be pretty homogenous. It ought to be kind of the same all the way through because it was made up of clumps that were all the same. But we don't see that. What we see, particularly with Earth, is that there is a core to Earth that is dense, made out of iron and nickel, real heavy stuff. I mean, if you've ever picked up a piece of iron, you know it weighs a lot. And that forms the core of Earth, and that's surrounded then by a bunch of silicate material that's less dense and has a crust that's even lighter silicate material than that. So how did this occur if we built Earth out of all the same stuff and it clumped all together, accreted together, all kind of in one big, big phase? Well, all that clumping together, as things slam into each other, that generates a lot of heat. And some of this material was unstable material that was going to undergo isotopic decay, radioactivity. 
generating heat. So the planet, as it starts to form, starts to heat up. And as it does that, the materials with the lower melting temperatures begin to melt. And finally, the whole ball becomes molten. And just like our solar system formed from a spinning disk with the heavier material moving toward the center, the same laws of physics apply to the globe, to the, the sphere that's becoming the planet. And now that it's molten, the material is mobile enough and it <coughs> starts with the denser material moving toward the center of the body, leaving behind the lighter silicate materials. So kind of that same process is going on, same laws of physics governing things, but it's happening on a planetary scale instead of a solar system scale. But the result is, instead of a planet that's homogeneous, made up of the same stuff all the way through, it's now layered with a iron nickel core, it's really dense, surrounded by a mantle of silicate rock that's less dense than a crust of silicate material that's even less dense than both of the, the previous. This is density stratification. Density is the process, and it's producing a globe, a sphere that is stratified, that is layered. And all of the planets are undergoing this to some degree or another. Some not that much. Earth, quite a bit. Venus, even more than Earth. Maybe. Certainly Mercury, because it's got a core that's about four-fifths the size of the planet. So we don't know if that was actually part of forming that core or if later on some of the outer part of the planet was knocked off in a collision. So all of this is going on in all these planets that are making these stratified bodies. One of the things that we did when we landed men on the moon was we set up seismic stations and we did experiments on the moon trying to determine whether the same kind of stratification process has happened on the moon. And what we discovered is the moon doesn't have much of a core. It might have a little core, a little iron nickel core, but for the most part, not much. So this is a problem. How did the moon form? We had a number of hypotheses. The most prevalent was that it simply formed right alongside the Earth. It was another of these accreting bodies. It didn't get as big as Earth. And because of that, Earth didn't have enough gravity to pull it in and accrete it, but it had enough gravity to pull it in and put it into orbit. But if the moon formed right alongside Earth, it would have been forming out of the same stuff that Earth formed out of and it would have gone through density stratification just like the Earth, and the moon should have an iron nickel core just like Earth does. But it doesn't. Ooh, that doesn't sound too good for that hypothesis, does it? The other idea was that the moon was formed way, way away in a different part of the galaxy, <coughs> and it came in, and Earth captured it in its gravitational field, put it into orbit. So, Okay, we've got a moon now that was, was built in a different part, so we wouldn't expect it to have the same kind of core as we'd see here on Earth. Problem is, every part of the, the universe has a, a signature set of elements, and um, this doesn't work for the moon being made someplace else. It doesn't fit that scenario. So it had to be something that showed up right around Earth's part of the universe. Well, yeah? What does the A and BYA stand for? Ah, uh, BYA is billions of years ago. Okay. okay. So we had to come up with a whole new hypothesis. Every idea we had about how the moon formed, uh, the moon landings proved that we didn't have the answer. We didn't know. So we started to look for new hypotheses. 
And the one that kind of fit the bill was what they called the impact theory. And that's the one we pretty much believe in today. Now we just completed the first complete mapping of the moon's magnetic field. That was done by satellites over the last couple of years. And uh, we've just got those data sets in and already it's kind of changing our ideas again. There is a little more of a core to moon than we, we had thought. But the impact theory is kind of the ruling hypothesis at the moment. What we think happened was about, oh, somewhere around 4.6, 4.5, someplace in there, billion years ago. Good question. Um, we had a collision between Earth and another planetary body. We think at this time there were about 13 planets out there. We only have eight today. We had nine, but Pluto got demoted. It's, it's really more of a Kuiper Belt object, so it's no longer a planet. Still there, just not a planet. So we've got 13 planets at this point in time, and it's a little crowded out there. And some of these planets are crossing paths in their orbits, and sure enough, one of these planets crosses Earth's orbit. Unfortunately, Earth was there at the time, and they collide. Now, this process was going on all the time during accretion. I mean, just because a big thing was glomming in all the little stuff and accreting it and getting bigger, it doesn't mean it couldn't run into something, and if they were about the same size, they were both going to just shatter. Pieces would go back out, and those pieces get re-accreted by other bodies. So this process of accretion and collision were kind of, you know, fighting each other. And this is just the end stages with giant planets. So Earth gets, gets hit by this other <laughs> planet, but instead of being a planet about the size of Earth, which if it had been, both that planet and Earth would have been shattered, and that would have been the end of Earth. It would have just been bits and fragments, would have been spewed out through the solar system, and those fragments would get re-accreted by the other planets. But that didn't happen. What happened was the planet that struck Earth was about the size of Mars. So that's about a quarter to a third the size of Earth. That meant Earth had a chance to survive. Depends on what textbook you read, they keep changing the name of this other planet, but the one that shows up the most is Orpheus. So I'm gonna call it Orpheus. And Orpheus basically slams into Earth. Just like Earth, though, Orpheus is densely stratified. It has an iron-nickel core. That's really dense stuff. When you get that moving, it wants to keep moving. It's got inertia. So in this collision, when they both collided, their silicate outer mantles <coughs> were crunched up, thrown out into space, but the iron-nickel core of Orpheus just keeps plowing into Earth. And it just keeps going until it hits the iron nickel core of Earth. The two merge and make a new, bigger iron nickel core. The stuff that really got thrown out into space was the silicate rock that made up the mantle and the crust. Maybe a little bit of iron nickel, but for the most part, it was the mantle. Now, if it gets thrown out far enough away from Earth, then Earth doesn't have enough gravity to pull it back. And that happened. Some of the stuff <coughs> stayed out there. Earth just couldn't pull it back. But most of the stuff started to be re-accreted, coming back in, slamming into Earth, and Earth started to essentially rebuild itself. But in the process, with all that accretion going on, Earth heated up again, with that impact and with this reaccretion process and became molten once again and took a while for it to cool back down as a new Earth. So we're not on Earth, we are on Earth Junior. We are on the reincarnated Earth. Doesn't this collision uh, account for the tail? Yeah, it probably does. Because normally, uh, we would expect everything to be rotating with the axial plane perpendicular 
to the, the cloud, the nebula that we started with as a rotating disk. And some of them are, are that way, but most of them are tilted. Usually the tilt is due to some of these collisions. For instance, um, it's, uh, Uranus, I believe, actually rolls on its side. Uh, Venus shows retrograde um, motion. In other words, it spins the opposite way that it, it, it's supposed to. And we think what's happened is Venus was in a collision where it got flipped upside down. So it's still spinning the same way. I mean, you can't stop it and start it in reverse, but all you have to do is flip it over and it's spinning relatively in reverse. We think that that's happened. So we gave Earth its tilt. And the stuff that got thrown out there that couldn't come back, that there wasn't enough gravity to pull it back, it started to accrete on its own out there. And in the process, it ended up forming today's moon. So the, the elegant part of this hypothesis is it accounts for the fact that there isn't much iron nickel up on the moon. Most of the iron nickel merged with the iron nickel core of Earth forming a new core to Earth, and the silicate material of the mantle that was spewed out, that became what it re-accreted to form the moon. So we can make the moon here with different material now. So that's kind of the cool, cool uh, hypothesis. And um, that's what we're still working on trying to uh, prove to a little higher degree of uh, certainty. Now, one of the things you have to think about here is the fact that we have made a new Earth. We've had this major collision, and Earth is completely different now than what we started out with. So remember this idea of having an open or a closed system, and we were making the assumption that we had a closed system, and everything then related back to that baseline condition? What happened in this Orpheus Earth collision? That's kind of like throwing the baseball in the can of water, isn't it? We just went from a closed uh, uh, situation to an open situation. So it, everything got changed. Since then, we haven't had another big collision like that. Things have stayed the same since this Orpheus Earth collision. So that's our new baseline. We reset the clock, essentially, and our baseline now is the Orpheus Earth collision at about 4.5 billion years ago. So this, this assumption of being a closed system, for us, it only takes us back to the Orpheus Earth collision. Everything before that is different, and we don't have direct evidence of it. We have to look at other things outside of the Orpheus Earth collision to determine the rest of the picture and then kind of fit Earth into that and figure out how that might have evolved the way it did. So we've gone from this closed to open situation. Every time we had a collision, it was another open situation in that area. So we're back to a closed system. Now, if we have a big, huge meteor strike and it changes all of Earth, there goes our closed system, right? Everything will kind of get related back to that meteor strike. Now, we've had meteor strikes, but the thing is they've been fairly regional to local on Earth scale. So even though they've reset the clock in those spots, the rest of Earth history has marched on and we, have, we can still look at Earth back to the original collision. So, when you look at the solar system today, we have these four planets close to the Sun, Mercury, Venus, Earth, and Mars, that are made up of rocky, high temperature material. Then we have a belt of asteroids, which is essentially the remnants of the accretion process that was used to make these four inner planets, what we call the rocky or the terrestrial Earth-like planets. That's the stuff that still is out there that hasn't finally gotten swept up, but it is still going on. I mean, we have meteor impacts, right? 
So that is the accretion process at its tail end. Luckily, we're down to the point where the 